Thanks so much to the worship team. Good morning, church. So great to see you. I know there's some of you that are back today for the first time. And yeah, I just think just the awareness of what the season has been and the privilege that it is to be back is just a great, great thrill. And for myself as well, driving here this morning, I realized that the last time I stood on this platform to deliver a sermon was the 8th of March. Today's the 8th of November. And uh, I'm sure you remember back to that series, People Jesus Met. It feels like that was two years ago, but that was uh, the series that we started the year with. And so I really count it a privilege. Thank you, Richard, for giving me this opportunity to preach today. There's a really cool website that I came across, and it's called Future Me. And it's a website where you can write a letter to yourself in the future, uh, and then you can pick a date that you'd like that letter to be delivered to your email inbox. And you can choose a date even 50 years into the future. And uh, you could choose to make that letter public so that when it eventually is sent to you in the future, everybody can read it. So I went on and I found this random letter from this girl by the name of Rebecca. And she sent this uh, email 10 years into the future. And it was delivered just two weeks ago. So let me read some of what she wrote to herself. Wow, I can't believe you're 32. That puts you in what? 2020. Right now, I'm 22 years old, working in an office, and not sure where my life is headed. I think about where you are, and I don't even know where that is. So I had to laugh to myself as I read this letter, because Rebecca made a whole lot of predictions that were possibly true about herself. She said things like, maybe you're a mom, maybe you're married, maybe you work for Disney. Now that's not why I laughed. I laughed because she never predicted maybe you're in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> and back in 2015, if you were asked, well, where do you see yourself five years from now? I doubt any one of you would have ever predicted that we would have lived and been living through what we're living through now. And I think we laugh not because the pandemic is not serious. We laugh because we take ourselves far too seriously. We think that we can predict the future and with our futurists and our scenario planners, we like to think that we've got our ducks in a row, we like to think that we've got our futures mapped out, but a season like this reminds us that any control we think we have is just the illusion of control. And lack of control leads to fear, leads to fear. In their book, The Cry of the Soul, the authors Allender and Longman write, all of us fear what we cannot control. Fear is our response to uncertainty about our resources in the face of danger. Fear is provoked when the threat of danger exposes our inability to preserve what we most deeply cherish. And I think our greatest fears are around things that are dear to us, that we cherish, that we love. And then we realize that in the light of these uncertainties, uh, our resources are lacking. And so we experience fear. And I think there are really two main ways that you can respond to fear, either with God or without God. If you respond with God, then it breeds trust and dependence. And if you respond without God, it's only gonna breed fear and anxiety and worry. And I think fear is particularly bad when it leads us away from God and into unbelief. Because when it leads us un into unbelief, and when those circumstances feel bigger than God himself, it's then that fear begins to cripple us and consume us and it just controls us. So I want us to turn to the book of Numbers. It's a book of the Bible we don't often turn to, but as you turn to the book of Numbers, and we're going to be in chapters 13 and 14 this morning, we read about a turning point, a kind of a watershed moment, if you like, in the nation of Israel. And it's this moment that the Psalms and even the book of Hebrews, a lot of other scriptures look back to with a real sense of disappointment in God's people because they allowed fear to get the better of them. So this was a battle, fear versus faith. So let me give you a bit of the background to get you up to speed as to where we are in Numbers chapter 13 and 14. The Israelites have been rescued from Egypt probably about two years prior to this event and they're now standing on the brink of the promised land and just think about this deliverance. I mean, there's Pharaoh, there's plagues, God has parted the Red Sea, the Egyptian army's, army's gone through that sea, God has closed in that sea. 
Now they're standing on the brink of the promised land and I can imagine the kids, because I remember what my kids were like, Dad, when are we gonna get there? And I can finally say, look over the Jordan. That's where the destination is, we finally arrived. But actually, you know, they were still a long way away, even though there was a short distance. And so they decide to select 12 spies, maybe we could call them scouts from each one of the tribes and each one of those scout leaders went across and they scouted out the land for 40 days and I mean 40 days of just thinking and meditating and probably praying and experiencing and just tasting what this land was like and they come back uh, and they meet the people of God on the other side of the Jordan again and they present their report. And at first it seems really, really positive, but in just a moment, suddenly fear enters in. And then they're focusing on the obstacles, they're focusing on the enemies, they're focusing on the fortified cities, and fear spreads throughout the entire Israelite camp, and there's weeping, and there's doubt, and there's unbelief, they're wanting to go back to Egypt. But Joshua and Caleb, two of those scouts, they stand up, and they bring an encouraging message to try and focus the people of God back onto God, but their ministry is rejected. And as a result, God punishes his people and they spend probably another 38 years or so, a total of 40 years, wandering in that wilderness as a result of fear. So I want us to be sure this morning that Joshua and Caleb's message of encouragement is not lost on us. It would be a great tragedy for us, in some sense, to be standing on the brink of something new and to miss what God wants to say to us through their ministry. It's a battle of fear versus faith on the brink of the promised land. So let's wind back the story to Numbers chapter 13. And let's ask ourselves what went wrong? How could they come back with such a positive report and then something went wrong? Well, the people of God forgot God. And fear forgets these four things about God. There's number one up on the screen. This is the first thing that fear forgets about God. It forgets God's promises. God's promises, and that's in Numbers chapter 13, verses one to 16. So right before the spies even head out onto their scouting mission, right up front, God reminds them of his promise. Here it is. The Lord said to Moses, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe, send one of its leaders. Now it's easy for us to just miss that promise, but there it is. The land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the Israelites. This was a promise that they'd been reminded of again and again and again, and we see it back in Genesis chapter 13. God first gave this promise to Abram in Genesis 12, but it's reiterated again and again, and here's one of the versions in Genesis 13. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had parted from him, look around from where you are, to the north and south, to the east and west, all the land that you see I'll give to you and your offspring forever. I'll make your offspring like the dust of the earth so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go, walk through the length and the breadth of the land for I am giving it to you. So there's God's promise hundreds of years before they even stood here on the brink of the promised land is this amazing promise. And back in Genesis, there are actually two promises. The first one was God was reminding the people that I will make you numerous, as numerous as the dust. And in other places, God says, as numerous as the stars in the sky. And the second promise was that he was gonna give them the promised land. That's why it's called the promised land. Now think about it, that one promise had been fulfilled. Imagine standing on the brink of the promised land and looking around and thinking, we've come a long way from when we were just Abraham and his wife Sarah who wasn't sure if she could ever have children. Here we are, probably two million in number. In fact, this is the book of numbers, so even the very title of this book is evidence that the people of God had grown. And they now have 12 tribes out of which to select 12 scouts, like 12 family lines. I mean, God has honored his word, this is true. So then they must have thought to themselves, surely the second promise will also be true that if God has made us numerous, surely he'll now also give us the land and honor his word. But we'll come to see that in just a moment, fear sets in, God's word goes out the window, and all of their doubts, all of the obstacles nullify these promises of God. 
They look at their circumstances and allow their circumstances to interpret God's promises and God's word instead of allowing God's promises and his word to interpret their circumstances. And then they say to themselves, not only are we not gonna be given this land, our numbers are gonna be shrunk, we are gonna be wiped out. So they are nullifying by their doubt and unbelief both of God's promises. And that's what fear does. Fear forgets God's promises. But number two, fear forgets God's purposes. His purposes, which we read about in Numbers 13 from verse 17. You see, fear forgets, but faith remembers how God has worked in the past. God, uh, faith calls to mind God's faithfulness. So let's read Numbers 13 from verse 17, and you might not see it at first, but faith has the ability to see God's fingerprints all over one's past. So we read, when Moses sent them, referring to the, the spies, to explore Canaan, he said, go up through the Negev and on into the hill country. Now let's just pause here. Back in Genesis 12 verse nine, that's exactly the route that Abraham took. He went up through the Negev. That's their forefather. Let's pick it up again in verse 18. See what the land is like and whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled or fortified? Or fortified? How is the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there trees in it or not? Do your best to bring back some of the fruit of the land. It was the season for the first ripe grapes. So they went up and explored the land from the desert of Zin as far as Rehob toward Lebo Hamath. They went up through the Negev and came to Hebron. Just file away Hebron in your minds for a moment. There's something significant here. Came to Hebron where Ahiman, Shesha, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak, lived. Hebron had been built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. So I want you to understand this picture. They were walking where their forefathers had walked. They were uh, going on almost the same pilgrimage that Abraham had been on centuries earlier. God's faithful purposes were seen around them in their own past, but it was seen in the present. And faith remembers what God has done in our past so that we can experience it in the present. But you know what fear does? Fear forgets the past, it forgets God's past purposes. In Genesis 13 and verse 17, part of what we read earlier, when God says to Abram, go walk through the length and breadth of the land for I'm giving it to you. We then read in verse 18, so Abram went to live near the great trees of Mamre at Hebron, where he pitched his tents and there he built an altar to the Lord. So this is where Abraham went to live, was Hebron, the very place that these scouts were walking, but there's something else about this special place of Hebron. And that is that in Genesis chapter 23, Abram buys some land in Hebron from the Hittites to use as a burial ground for his family. So in fact, Abram himself was buried in Hebron, as was his wife Sarah, he buried her there. His son Isaac and his wife Rebekah were buried in Hebron. Jacob and his wife Leah were buried in Hebron. In fact, all of Jacob's sons, except for Joseph, were buried in Hebron. So I imagine them walking around and if you've ever taken your kids to a museum, you would know that sometimes they're bored stiff. <laughs> but this was no walking through a museum, yawning. They were walking on holy ground. They were walking over and on God's faithfulness. This is where their family had lived. This is where their family had died. They were being reminded of God's purposes in the past being fulfilled today. They must have, over those 40 days, thought, hang on a minute, all that God had wrapped up in their lives is being fulfilled in our lives. Surely that's gonna keep us from fear. How could they miss God's faithfulness? This is where Abraham had faced challenges. This is where Isaac had, had doubted. This is where this one had failed and given up on God, but God had remained faithful and his grace had been at work and transforming this. This is where God helped our forefathers. Surely he's gonna continue to help us. But as we'll see, just a moment, it goes out the window. Fear forgets God's promises and fear forgets God's faithful purposes in one's past. And that's the third thing. Fear forgets God's provision. His provision in Numbers chapter 13 from verse 23. When they reached the valley of Eshcol, 
They cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Two of them carried it on a pole between them along with some pomegranates and figs. Just imagine this pole with these massive grapes on. Uh, that's the logo for the, the Ministry of Tourism in Israel. That's their logo, this picture of the two guys with the, with the grapes. That place was called the Valley of Eshkol because of the cluster of grapes the Israelites cut off there. At the end of 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. So they're showing off God's provision. They say here is undeniable, indisputable, irrefutable proof that God is a God of generosity, of provision. This is undeniable contemporary evidence. Just look at these massive grapes. You can taste them if you like. Yeah, come and taste and see that the Lord is good. This is a land that flows with milk and honey. And yes, we know that because God had really told us this throughout the previous books of the Bible that this was gonna be a place that flowed with milk and honey. But we wanna tell you we have been there. We have stood there. Yes, we're grateful for God's word that's told us that, but we are experiencing this now in the present, contemporary, current evidence. Here it is for yourselves. Raymond Brown, the Old Testament commentator, says, when threatened by imminent change, we feel hesitant, insecure, vulnerable, and even bewildered, but we must look carefully around at our present scene and itemize the clusters from our contemporary experience. If we take a trip to our own cluster valley, we are likely to find abundant evidence of God's unfailing generosity. I wanna challenge you, in fearful times, that's what we forget, we only focus on the obstacle and we miss even current experience of God, current provision of God. Even in the season, uh, some of you maybe saw that Facebook post because Pat King passed away. And she did our flowers each week and I paid tribute to her on Friday afternoon, which was her birthday and her memorial service on the same day. And I went back in my archives and found all those beautiful photographs from Easter's and Christmas's. There's my favorite ones, that one from Pentecost Sunday and all the, the flowers she did week by week for the online service. And if you watch the online service, you'll see no flowers there. And as I went back and I just looked through that YouTube channel and just to see what God's done even in this season when, when we didn't know and hearing stories, fear forgets all of that, but faith rehearses those things and thanks God. Fear forgets God's promises, his faithful purposes in one's past, forgets God's provision and fourthly, fear forgets God's presence and power. In Numbers 13 and verse 28, there comes a massive but. A massive but. They took their eyes off God's presence, they took their eyes off God's power, and they allowed their enemies to eclipse God's presence, to eclipse God's power. And after such a massive report, here's its fruit, suddenly the word but. But, 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 the people who live there are powerful. The cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev. The Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country. The Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. I think they're saying there's no space for us. We thought we'd have a little corner. We wouldn't have to face any struggles, but there's people everywhere. We can't just move in. Verse 30, the voice of sanity. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. Look at verse 31. But, 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 the men who'd gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes and we looked the same to them. It's hard to believe. 
such a sudden turn, but you and I know what that's like because we know our own hearts. We can have experienced all of these four things we've spoken about and they can go out a window in the moment. They left God completely out of the equation. And when people become big, God becomes small. It's called the fear of man. When people become big, God becomes small. Without God in their picture, without God in the picture, their problems were magnified and their resources were minimized. And they moved from faith to fear in a matter of moments. It's kind of like one of those gestalt uh, optical illusion pictures that's been in, in every uh, textbook in high school. You know that one with the duck and the rabbit? And you kind of look and then suddenly it's, your perspective shifts and you see the duck. That's what happened in just a moment they suddenly saw the duck of despair and the duck of unbelief and they just couldn't see God's perspective anymore. And when fear forgets God, it alters the very fabric of reality. It distorts the fabric of space-time itself, if you want to put it that way. Because God's presence seems far away, not near, and God doesn't seem powerful, he seems weak. Alan and Longman in their book, Cry of the Soul, and they've got a whole section about fear. They say most significantly, fear distorts our picture of God. God seems weak, uninvolved, or uncaring in the midst of our troubles. After all, we think if he were strong and concerned, he would not leave us in this mess. Fear reverses reality by making evil seem all conquering and God impotent. But God is not impotent. Can I hear an amen? God is not impotent. The scriptures tell us that God is omnipotent. And there's an infinite distance between impotency and omnipotency. But not only does fear distort our view of God, it distorts our view of ourselves. And no sooner have they taken their eyes off God and they begin to see themselves with self-doubt. Self-doubt. Look at some of the things they said. We can't attack those people. They're stronger than us. Then they looked at one another and said, I don't remember you looking like a grasshopper. Look at me, I'm a grasshopper. They said, even to ourselves, we seemed like grasshoppers. We didn't even interview the giants about how we looked. We just, to ourselves, we looked like grasshoppers. And then they said, the land devours those living in it. And I want to say to them, how illogical. You've just told us that they're massive giants. You've told us that there's this fruit, that there's this abundance, that there's fertility. Now you want to say the land devours everyone that's in it? Can't you see the contradiction? Fear is messing with your head and, and every time fear knocks on the front door, you know what happens? Logic, rationality goes out the window. And healthy fear always exaggerates the shadows. And I think the danger for us as a church is that we would slip into a grasshopper mentality that feels so weak against an intimidating culture. And we look at that culture and we say, oh, we feel like grasshoppers, oh, the land is gonna devour us. But where is God in our thinking? Because when you think like a grasshopper, you end up being perceived as a grasshopper. It kind of becomes like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Sometimes the fear that you actually fear and you're hoping to avoid is actually the fear that then plays out in your life, and that's exactly what happened. The people of God didn't want to go into the promised land for fear that they'd be wiped out, and what happened? They never made it into the promised land, and their bodies lay in that wilderness. They died anyway. This is a battle of fear versus faith on the brink of the promised land. Two opposing views. We can, we certainly can, versus we can't. Remember Caleb back in verse 30, we already read it. Caleb silenced the people and said, we should go up and take possession of the land for we can certainly do it. And the men who had gone up with him said, we can't. We can and we can't. Isn't it amazing that two people can look at the same sets of data, the same stuff in front of them and yet interpret it differently because it depends whether it's with God or without God. For Caleb, God is bigger, God is stronger, God is mightier. Fear forgets, but faith remembers. It remembers that God is powerful, that God is present with us. In fact, God tells us about Caleb in Numbers 14 and verse 24, that Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly. He has a different spirit. It's a spirit that says, Lord, I'll take you at your word. I will believe your promises. I will believe your provision. I will believe your purposes from past. I think this is a sad reminder. Numbers 13 and 14 is a sad reminder 
that often it seems, even in my own ministry as I look back on years, that fear spreads faster than faith. Man, it's so hard for us sometimes to believe. And when you read the Gospels, you just see the common strand amongst all the disciples was unbelief. It's like, you guys have seen me feed the 5,000. Now you're doubting me again. You've seen me really calm this storm. Now there's just this unbelief. And it happens so quickly because of our sinful nature. And that's what fear does. It just spreads faster than faith. But we need to guard our hearts. Because it's been said that in God's church, pessimism Pessimism has done far more harm to God's church than atheism ever did. And that's the reality. We can actually live more like atheists even though we claim to be God's people. These aren't atheists that God's judging. These are, they have tasted all the blessings for centuries. It's these people who are missing God's grace in the moment they need his grace. And all it took was for the majority of the spies to spread this bad report. And look what happened by night time. By that night, as this stuff spread through the camp, Numbers chapter 14, that night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled. And I think one of the first warning signs that you're beginning to shift your focus from God to your circumstances is when you begin to grumble. Verse two. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole assembly said to them, if only we had died in Egypt or in this wilderness, why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Grumbling is a sin that we often just tolerate in our lives. And there's a whole sermon. And the New Testament also talks about grumbling. The Greek word for grumbling is gogosmos. And I think I've told you before, it sounds like what it is. Gogosmos, gogosmos, gogosmos. The Hebrew word for grumbling is just the same word as the word for meditation. Because that's what grumbling is. It's meditating. But meditation is meditating on God's truth. It's saying, I'm gonna choose to take my fears and I'm gonna meditate on what God's truth, get it into my soul, that's what I'm gonna think about, that's what I'm gonna lie awake about. I'm gonna lie awake thinking about God's truth, but grumbling focuses on what's wrong, what's negative, and it rehearses that. It's interesting that it's the same word. But they grumbled and rebelled against their leaders, and so what that really means is they were grumbling against God. They turned what should have been their God-given destiny into distraught weeping that went on all night. They disowned everything that God had done in the past up until this point, even the last few years of getting here on a strange path, which Richard was telling us about as a staff on on Thursday in our staff chapel, about the strange route that they took once they were out of Egypt. They've been through all of that. They've seen God's provision in the wilderness and the giving of the law and all of this, and they've just thrown it all away. Listen to how Raymond Brown describes them. It is their most rebellious language so far. They wished to eradicate from memory everything that had happened since the first Passover. It was a hideous desire, totally inconsistent for people with even the slightest notion of God's abundant and undeserved generosity. They forgot the God of the patriarchs. They forgot the God of the exodus. Again, think about these massive events, the massive miracles. Uh, I mean, they're released from captivity they'd, they'd witnessed like two years ago. They asked the why question. Why, why, why? Why is the Lord bringing us into this land? They're doubting his wisdom. And why is God bringing them into this land? It's because he loves them. He wants to bless them. He wants to show them his grace. He wants to make them a blessing to other nations. Yeah, you know, it's not gonna be easy. There's gonna be challenges, but since when has life not had challenges? They say our wives and children will be taken as plunder. They doubt God's love. And then perhaps most blasphemous of all, they reject his redemption. And they say, wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? Just think about that mindset. To rather go back to Egypt which is symbolic of sin and slavery and bondage and captivity, to rather go back to that because you feel at least there's some certainty in that rather than to go into an unknown future with God 
You'd rather go back to Egypt into bondage. Clearly they'd forgotten how bad it was, but that's what fear does, it messes up our heads. Imagine coming so far in your journey with God only to falter just before the promised land, to run the comrade, so to speak, and to just say, I'm gonna give up one meter from the finish line. To give up trusting God at the very moment that trust is needed. To rather choose the safety of what is certain over the uncertain that is good. And then they come to the conclusion that we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. And they despise God's appointed leader, which means they were despising God's authority over them. They were despising God's word to them. Choosing to believe their fears rather than their father. And so there's a warning for us. And that warning is that God's work in your past is no guarantee that you'll trust him today. It's no guarantee that you'll trust him tomorrow if you don't wake up today and say, Lord, help my unbelief. Help me to trust you, Lord. This is a storm I haven't faced before. Lord, use the past to sustain me today. A new temptation, a new obstacle, a new enemy. Is your theology today strong enough to withstand the storm that's to come? Think about Elijah. I mean, he'd witnessed God's power on Mount Carmel, calling down fire, proving God's supremacy over all those false gods. That was his Sunday ministry. And then what happened on Monday's day off? I think Richard and I know what that feels like. On Monday's day off, he just gets this word that Jezebel's out to get him. And what happens? He goes and sits under a tree and he asks God to take his life. He wants to die. And I read that and I think, what's going on? You just saw the glory of God and now one little woman is chasing you and you wanna give up and die. But I think you and I know what it's like after great victories, sometimes we're weak. Or what about Peter? We read that passage, Conrad read it to us. Here he's walking on the water. He's the only disciple that had the boldness to get out the boat and walk on that water by faith. He's seen Christ, he's seen miracles. He's the one that's professed with his mouth, you are the son, Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. And yet in that moment of fear, around that campfire, it seems as if he's thrown it all away in that moment. And he denies knowing the person that he claims to love. We mustn't be presumptuous. We need to guard our hearts on a daily basis. And I encourage you maybe this afternoon, read the rest of Numbers chapter 14. There's so much good stuff in there. But as a result of their rebellion in the face of fear, God punishes his people. Verses 26. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, how long will this wicked community grumble against me? I've heard the complaints of these grumbling Israelites, so tell them, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very thing I heard you say. In this wilderness, your bodies will fall. Every one of you, 20 years old or more, who was counted in the census and who's grumbled against me. Not one of you will enter the land I swore with uplifted hand to make your home except Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, son of Nun. As for your children that you said would be taken as plunder, I will bring them in to enjoy the land you have rejected. Even here in the midst of discipline is God's love and his grace. He doesn't abandon his people for the next 40 years. He's still with them, still providing, still putting up with their for God and against God and their grumbling and his grace to their children. You said, I, would, I don't love you, died of my love. I'm gonna bring your children in to enjoy what you have rejected. Brothers and sisters, we too stand on the brink of something new. I have no idea what it is. God has brought Richard to us in the season at the same time that he brought the season of COVID. I don't know why that is, but God has. We can talk to our futurists and our scenario planners and I don't think they'll tell us exactly what 2021 is gonna look like. And maybe for some of you, you wanna go back to the past. Maybe the good old days. Sometimes when I go on Facebook, I hate it because there's some people who even wanna go back as far as apartheid and rather live in apartheid than live with uncertainty. And there's still deep and and, and hidden racism in their hearts. But you and I as well can wanna go back to the past. Like, this isn't normal in a way and we don't even know what the new normal is and maybe this is a season of rebuilding Rosebank in some senses past as we say, well, Where are all the people? These are the numbers online. These are the people that return. We don't know. What's God going to do? Certainly hope we're not going to go into lockdown for the next 40 years. (laughs) But we too are in a battle of fear versus faith in the midst of a pandemic of fear. And can I ask you, how many of you have heard of Shamua, Shapat, 
Egal, Palti, Gadiel, Gedi, Amil, Satur, Nabi, and Gil. You and I remember nothing about the 10 scouts that had fear. We don't know anything about them. In fact, their fear was completely wasted because they died in the desert and we don't even remember their names. We don't call our kids. I've never met anyone called Gadi. How's it, Egal? That's not what we call our kids. We call our kids Caleb and Joshua. How can we remember those two scouts? Because they had faith in God despite the fear. And because of those 10 scouts, God's people wandered for 40 years. The majority of God's people missed out on what was just over the hill, just across the river. And I think if you and I won't cross the Jordan, it simply means God will take someone else, those that want to go. I don't know about you, but I don't want to miss out on all that God's got planned for us in the future. I don't want to dishonor God. I don't want to reject all that he's done in our past as a church over 115 years. I don't want to reject what he's done in my life and doubt his promises. I want to trust him for what he's still going to do in the future. But fear keeps us just outside the promised land. Fear has never advanced the kingdom of God. Fear always cripples faith. And you can read, if you go and read Numbers 14, they even want to stone Caleb and Joshua and their leaders. That's what fear does. And we need to pray for more leaders like Moses and Aaron and Joshua and Caleb. Because look at verses five to nine of Numbers 14. Then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly gathered there. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, who were among those who'd explored the land, tore their clothes. They said to the entire Israelite assembly, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he'll lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only, only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will devour them. Their protection is gone but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. As we wrap up, can I ask one final question? How's it possible that Joshua and Caleb were so fearless when compared to the majority? They saw the same things, same enemies, same giants, same cities, same data, but they interpreted it differently because their secret wasn't that they didn't experience fear. Their secret was that they allowed their fear of God to swallow up the lesser fears. They feared God more than they feared what the giants could do. They feared God's name, God's glory. They were more afraid of dishonoring God, of treating his promises as false, of spurning his word, of doubting his power and his nearness than they were of what the giants could do to them. And I think that dealing with fear is always a struggle around our deepest allegiances. What is your deepest allegiance as you face enemies? It's not a matter of whether we fear, it's a matter of what and whom we fear. So I want to encourage you with God's word this morning, fear versus faith. There's gonna be some things up on the screen and I want you as a congregation to read the verses out loud. I'm gonna read what fear says and I'm gonna read what God says and then we're gonna read the truth of what God says and I want you to read the verse that's in the middle of the screen. So let's do this together. Let's speak God's word over our fears. Fear says, I am alone. God says, I am with you. Let's read together. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Fear says, I'm too weak. God says, I am your strength. Let's read. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Fear says, I'm scared. God says, I am your courage. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Fear says, I can't make it. God says, I'll get you through it. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out 
so that you can endure it. Fear says, I cannot. God says, I can. Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Brothers and sisters, let's not forget God in this season. The same God who parted the Red Sea, the same God who freed his people from Egypt is the same God on the brink of the promised land. He's the same God who raised Jesus Christ from the dead and he is with you. That means that whatever scares you today doesn't scare God. Whatever seems big and insurmountable to you is not so to God. Your only hope is to run to the one who holds your future in his hands and bring him your fears. Ask him to swallow your fears in his greatness, in his majesty. Allow those fears to drive you, to press into Christ, to trust him more, to read his word more, to experience the power of his spirit more so that you can press on with courage. One of the first things a leader ever said to me when I became a Christian, it's one of those cliched Christian sayings, but it's a cliche because it's true. This is what he said. I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. And that always stuck with me. I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. Let's pray. Hi, Heavenly Father, we just come in confession knowing that we have such fickle hearts that one day we can blow hot and the next we can blow cold. The one day we can feel as though we're trusting you and the next day something goes wrong in our lives and just doubt floods our soul and in a sense the, the fear spreads through the camp of all of our faculties, our thoughts, our imaginations, our wills, our behavior. Our... Lord, we, we need the truth of your word to combat the lies that fear will tell us. And Lord, wherever there's unhealthy fear in our lives, fear that is leading us into unbelief, to doubt you, that Lord, we would bring it to you. I pray that you'd help us in these days, Lord, when we're so afraid, when I know that there are people in this congregation right now and some that are watching online, others that are not here, who are dealing with deep, deep waters, Lord. News from a doctor, pain, unemployment, family troubles, Lord, it's in those moments that we need to trust you the most. And so I pray that you would give us the faith that we need to have at the very point that faith is required, that our faith would not fail you, that you would pray for us even as you prayed for Peter, that his faith would not fail him. Lord, help our unbelief, we pray. Help us to trust you for new things. Lord, to be a people who are bold, who are courageous. Lord, to step out in faith, to remember you and not to forget you because we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.